Hey, everybody. Paul Gray here. Thanks for joining me for another edition of Grace to All with Paul Gray. Today, I want to talk to you about God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. I've told you all before that, of course, God is good. Now, I'd like to ask you to ponder just for a minute, what does God do? I'm going to wait just a few seconds intentionally and ask you, what does God do? What do you think? What does God do? Well, God, who is love, loves. <laughs> he just loves. And primarily he loves, he expresses his love by giving. Grace is God's love, giving us all the things for our life and for our being like God, which is not squeaky, clean morality type thing. It's being good, joyful, at peace, patient, helping, loving, serving one another. You all know the probably the most famous Bible verse of all, John 3.16, Jesus himself said this, God so loved the entire cosmos that he gave us Jesus so that none of us would perish. And contrary to what you may have been taught, that word perish means missing the mark of God's abundant life, missing the mark of knowing who God is, knowing who we are, who everybody else is, not being whole like God wants us to be in abundant life. Instead, uh, not having good physical, emotional, relational, financial, spiritual lives. But God doesn't want us to not have those. He wants us to be completely, this is what the word sozo, this translated salvation means, full and complete and whole, physically, emotionally, relationally, financially, spiritually. The, the word that we translate as saved it really doesn't mean that. It means being whole. It has nothing to do with heaven. <laughs> as it has everything to do with the here and now, uh, primarily because heaven is here and now. Jesus prayed, of course, Father, your will in heaven be done on earth. Uh, we are in heaven. We are in the kingdom realm right now. Most of us aren't aware of that. And those of us who are aware of it aren't aware of it all the time. But in the invisible realm, the kingdom of God, that's where we already are, according to scripture. Unfortunately, religion's talking snake oil God has conned us into thinking that saved is avoiding hell and going to heaven sometime later. That's not at all what the word means. Peter wrote this in 2 Peter 1, 3 to 4. Everything we could ever need for life and godliness has already been deposited in us by God's divine power. He said, all this was lavished upon us through the rich experience of knowing Jesus, who has called us by name and invited us to come to him through a glorious manifestation of his goodness. As a result of this, he has given you and me and everyone magnificent promises that are beyond all price, so that through the power of these tremendous promises, we can experience partnership with the divine nature by which you have escaped the corrupt desires that are of this world. And contrary to what you and I were taught, escaping the corrupt desires of this world, I believe, means escaping the corrupt, corrupt desires of religion in attempts to make yourself pleasing to an angry, distant, list-keeping, punitive God that doesn't even exist. In Luke 12, 32, Jesus said this, it is your father's delight to give you the kingdom. And in another place in Luke, he said, he's already done it. The kingdom of God is in you. And he said that to people who didn't like him, who hated him and didn't think God was like what he thought he was. Paul wrote this in Ephesians 1, 5, after Jesus revealing it to him personally. He said, it was always Papa's plan to adopt us as his delightful children. We are delightful to God, no matter what our actions are. Now, he doesn't delight in 
us taking actions that hurt ourselves or others, just like we don't delight in those actions with our kids, humanly speaking, but we still love our kids and we do still delight in them as our offspring. Ephesians 1, 6, this unfolding plan gives God great pleasure. God takes great pleasure in revealing to us who he is, who we are, and who everybody else is, and revealing to us what he, all the gifts and promises and things he's given us. Ephesians 1, 9, father was delighted to implement his plan when we said the magic prayer. Oh, no. Uh, when we started going to church. Uh, oh, no. When we went to confirmation class. Oh, no, no. When we first took communion. Oh, no. Father was delighted to implement his plan before time. Don't get mad at me for saying that. That's what your book says. That's what Paul wrote in Ephesians 1, 9. God the Father was delighted to include us and lavish us with all grace and implement his plan for us before time. He was delighted. God, who is love, delights to give. And we are made in his image and likeness. His image is our identity. Likeness is growing into and manifesting who we really are. We are those who love and delight in giving. I bet there's some things in your life that you never did for a long time, and then you found out about them, and you did them, and you delighted in them. Uh, that's what giving is like. When we give, <laughs> we, we delight. We delight in giving. 1 John 4, 17. As Jesus is in this world right now, so are you and me and everyone else. Most of us, of course, don't yet know that. But we're learning, aren't we? We are love. We are hardwired to express our love by giving and enjoy it. We may not have that full revelation yet, but we're getting there. Romans 8, 28 and 29, the Apostle Paul said this. We are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually being woven together for good. For we are God's lovers who have been called to fulfill his design purpose, which is to love and delight in giving. For he knew all about us before we were born, and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. This means the son, Jesus, is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. He is making us just like him. Other versions say conforming us to the image of Christ. Now, the footnotes there in Romans 8, 28, this is from the Passion Translation. Brian Simmons says the Aramaic for God working all things together is harmony. God works all things together harmoniously. Now, most of you listening, watching uh, this podcast, this video, watching on YouTube or wherever, you already have the foundation. You've been listening to me and you've been listening to great teachers like Baxter Kruger and Steve McVeigh and Don Keithley, and Malcolm Smith and others. You have this foundation. It's a worldwide tsunami that's just, it, it, man, it's spreading everywhere like wildfire in little groups of people all over the world in every town and city of people who are coming to know and understand and grasp this revelation that God is good. And he delights in being good to us and everyone. And we're made in his likeness and image. And all of that happened before the creation of the world, before we were born. We didn't even have a boat on it. <laughs> we have this foundation that God is perfect love, abounding grace, and total inclusion of everyone, and pure light with no trace of darkness. And we're learning to recognize the counterfeit versions of religion's snake oil God, uh, con God who is, well, he doesn't even exist, but people, that God, what people think about him is that he's angry and list-keeping and punitive and hard to, can't really be appeased, can't even stand to be around us. Fortunately, that God doesn't even exist, but most people think he does, and they live in bondage to that darkness. But Jesus came and shines a light in everyone's heart. At some point in time, everyone will get it. 
And we have the great privilege and pleasure of partnering him with him and revealing that to people. Jesus went around doing good, healing the sick, restoring people in every way, physically, spiritually, with restoring their sight, setting them free, healing, feeding, providing everything. Jesus was blessed and he was blessed as he blessed. He delighted in it. He's the great example of us, not the example for us, but the example of us, what a human being can be when we know who we are in Christ. And Jesus knew, of course, what he told Abraham centuries earlier. Remember, Jesus said, Abraham delighted <laughs> in seeing me. All right. This was centuries before Genesis 12. Jesus, God said to Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing to all people. Blessing, blessing, blessing. Here's what Paul said about himself and Jesus. Paul, formerly Saul, the Jesus hater, the Christian hater, uh, the religious zealot who was out to kill all Christians and did kill some of them. Here's what he wrote, summarizing his ministries in Acts chapter 20. He got together the uh, elders of the church of Ephesus, which he started and pastored for a while. He got him together. He knew he was leaving. He was going to a place where he probably would die, and eventually he did. And he said this, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Now, remember that. I'm going to come back to that. We must help the weak, remembering Paul said, the words of Jesus. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than receive. The Passion translates that as, there is great joy in the act of giving. You've heard that phrase before. It's more blessed or blessed to give than receive. Have you experienced that yet? Now, today, there are lots of ways we who are like Christ is, Christ is in us, who are like he is in the world. There are many ways we can go around doing good, blessing people, helping the weak, and being blessed as we do. We are only limited by our imaginations, and the mind of Christ is our imagination. Every day, with our family, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, and with ourselves, we can do what Jesus did. We can give love in all its varied expressions. As Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 5, verse 22, grace is the all-encompassing, manifesting power of joy, peace, uh, love is, and love is grace in action. Love, grace in action is the all-encompassing, manifesting power of joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, Christ faith, compassion, mercy, and forgiveness, all done by Christ living as us, not us trying to do it in our own power, doing it by the power of the Holy Spirit of Christ in us. And as we manifest all those things, as we give all those things to other people, love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, forgiveness, compassion, all those things, we delight in doing that. It's not a chore. It's fun. We delight in doing that. And we are blessed as a result. Now, from time to time, we have specific certain individuals in our circle of family and friends to help. We hopefully we all do that. That was the pattern of the uh, of the early church. The, the, the first church really got this in Acts chapter two, verse 42. And I'm summarizing here. Those people, the very first people uh, right after Jesus raised from the dead, went back to heaven, Pentecost came. This church started on the day of Pentecost. And within just a few days, it says their hearts were mutually linked to one another. They were continually sharing. They had a deep sense of holy awe sweeping over everyone. 
the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. They fellowshiped as one body. They shared with one another whatever they had. Like today, if somebody had an extra microwave that they weren't using, if somebody else in their group needed a microwave, they just give it to them. That kind of thing. <clears throat> okay, they uh, find my place here. Uh, out of generosity, the text says, they even sold their assets to distribute the proceeds to those who were in need among them. And my wife and I are doing that right now. We're in the process of, of uh, selling a grand piano that we have that uh, we've had for almost 50 years, a Steinway Baby Grand Piano. And we're selling that. We're going to give the money from that to uh, a new ministry that we're involved in that specifically pri uh, provides help to single parents. And I'm going to be telling more about that uh, in the podcast for next week. But I, yeah, I'm not saying that you should do anything like that. I'm not looking for a pat on the back or anything, but we, we have some specific, uh, we have a, a lot of different reasons why we want to help single parents. And this is a way that we can raise some money uh, to do that. All right, that first church, in addition to selling their assets to distribute the proceeds who were in need among them, they met together and celebrated with joyful hearts and tender humility. A big part of what that first church did when they got together was to celebrate how they were helping each other by sharing what they had with other people, by selling what they had and giving money to people who were in need. I just envision them getting together. These were house groups. That, you know, these weren't uh, specific church buildings. That didn't come till much later. These were groups that met in houses. They would get together. They have meals together. They would uh, celebrate the wonderful stories of how you know somebody would get up and say, "Wow, I I needed this, and so and so over here gave me that, and I needed this and couldn't afford to pay for it, and somebody over there sold a donkey they had and gave me the money to pay for it." Stuff like that just went, in all, went on all the time. I, ha I have a friend who I've interviewed on this podcast before, Mike Popovich, who has uh, a ministry like that. It's called Inspire 100. And he helps people all the time like that. And the new ministry that, uh, that we're starting here is, is doing the same thing. And again, I'll tell you more about that next time. But they would just get together and they would celebrate these wonderful things that had happened. The text says they were continually filled with praises to God enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord kept adding to their number daily those who were coming to light. Now, many other translations say the Lord kept adding to the church daily those who were being saved. This translation, the Passion, is from the Aramaic, which is, of course, what Jesus spoke and the other disciples. The Lord kept adding to their number daily, those who were coming to light. The Aramaic, the word that's uh, sometimes translated as church, or in this instance, their number, means the joining of meet and come. People who had met Jesus came together and formed this new community. And the Greek word for that is ecclesia, which means the called out ones. Those who meet Jesus and come to groups of people who are Christ followers are also called out from somewhere. They are called out from religion. That's where the first church came from. People who were called out from religion, which at that time was the Jewish religion. And in other towns, there were other pagan gods that people uh, worshiped too, that uh, they became Christians and they came out from those groups not called to another religion or a new religion, coming out of religion. Religion actually means to, the original word means to bind up. And it's, it's all about people worshiping gods who don't exist, trying to gain and maintain a right relation, relationship with those demanding, full of wrath, list-keeping gods. Jesus calls his father the only true God, and said and taught and showed us that 
he's not like that at all. So they were called out from those belief systems into following Christ. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to tell you next uh, time on here about uh, the new group that we're involved in starting. Uh, and that I, I, I want you to hear about it. And I want you to see what's going on in helping single parents who are some of the most vulnerable at all. I want you to see uh, what's happening there. And you might want to start a group like that or participate in ours, or uh, you're going to get to hear stories about it. Uh, uh, one way or another. So thank you all for listening today. Thanks for being a part of Grace to All. Love you all. See you next time.